Welcome to The Rational Egoist. I'm your host, Michael Leibowitz. We've been doing a series on some of the great classical liberal slash libertarian thinkers. And back once again to, to do the same is Mr. James Stevens Valiant. Jim, welcome back and welcome to talking about Mr. Henry Hazlitt today. You know, we're, you know, these last couple episodes, Ludwig von Mises was last time and now we're doing Henry Hazlitt, who was a good friend of his, by the way, and a stupendous admirer and promoter of his work. Uh, here we have another of my all time heroes like Ludwig von Mises, Henry Hazlitt. Henry Stuart Hazlitt is the greatest journalist economics has ever known. He is the clearest writer on economics the field has ever known. <laughs> and that is part of it. He was a journalist. He was a journalist par excellence. He was a literary critic, an economist, uh, in his own way, a philosopher. He was even a novelist. He, But you know something? One of the astonishing things about this guy is he's also one of the greatest autodidacts in human history. I was just going to ask you that because he's not he, actually um, an economist. Well, no, he never, he never... Look, he started at City College in New York, but because his mother, his twice widowed mother, he was, uh, he come, he, look, the guy came from uh, a good family, but his mother was very unfortunate. You know, he's a, a collateral descendant of the English essayist Thomas yeah. Aslan. William, and, William, right? Yes, William Aslan. Oh, gosh. I, mean, I hope I don't make, if I make mistakes like that, you correct me. Yes, of course, the famous English essayist William Hazlitt. Thank you. Uh, he, so he came from a good family, uh, but and he was born in Philadelphia, raised in Brooklyn because his mom married someone else, his stepdad. But his stepdad died when he was just a baby. So his twice widowed mother really was out on her own and really had no means of support. He had to quit college. He was starting to attend City College in New York. He had to quit college as a teenager so he could support his twice widowed mother. I'm not exaggerating this. He grew up in relative poverty. And so you all these people say, all these capitalists, free market advocates, they're all rich from rich families. And no, he grew up in, in poverty. He could not afford to go to university. So before, no, he didn't get a PhD or a doctorate in anything. No, he never taught at university. Um, but he did publish in uh, academic journals, though as well as popular journals. Most of his work were for big, important journals, such as The Nation magazine. We think of it as a left wing, but he was there in the 1920s. Oh, we'll get to that. But he was there in the 1920s when The Nation magazine went from classical liberal to socialist leftist. And uh, but he was a literary critic. He was the literary editor for The Nation magazine in the late 1920s, if you can believe it. An astonishing man, as a teenager, because he couldn't go to college, he started to work at the Wall Street Journal. And I mean, he would do anything. He came in saying, I will sweep the floors all the way. Well, he started, he actually, we well, do a little better than that. You'll be the secretary for the uh, managing editor of the Wall Street Journal. So as a teenager, he was doing all kinds of work for the Wall Street Journal, other than direct writing, but he was learning the journalism business, every aspect of it from the inside out uh, as a young man. <laughs> so it's practical, real world experience that motivated him uh, at, at every step of the way. Now, he, when he wanted to go to university, he had actually envisioned himself. He already had intellectual heroes. He was already an incredible autodidact. He wanted to be uh, a philosopher like Herbert Spencer or a psychologist like William James. And if you think about it in that context, Herbert Spencer and William James are not the worst, politically speaking, you could have picked. Uh, William James, of course, being a pragmatist has his issues, but his heroes were okay. I mean, you think about it. Uh, he was he already admired uh, Herbert Spencer. He already was uh, uh, over in a different area, and he was very concerned about philosophical issues, psychological issues. He wanted to be a philosopher or psychologist, and had he had the resources, he probably would have ended up being a professor of philosophy or a professor of economics somewhere. But I'm glad you said that, Jim. Hold on one second. I'm glad you mentioned that William James had his issues because he was a pragmatist. The reason I'm happy about that is because Henry Hazlitt was a utilitarian. Yes. A as was Mises. Yes. Yet Ayn Rand was friends with both. Yes. And she thought both had good contributions to cap to defending capitalism. My, my re the reason that's important to me is because it, it seems among some objectivists, there's this idea that if somebody's not going to defend capitalism the same way they do, 
then you can't work with them. You can't associate with them. They've got nothing to offer. But clearly, um, uh, Ludwig von Mises and Henry Hazlitt had something to offer. And that's just not my opinion. And I don't say, well, Ayn Rand said it, so it's true. I say it because disciples of hers seem to think that that's the, the route that she would go. But it, it's not. And it just seems to me like if I come across people that are willing to make the argument for the things that I agree with, I don't have to agree with them for the reasons for it, all of them. I can dispute with them. We can argue about it. That's fine. But they're not my enemies. And Hazlitt was not an enemy to Ayn Rand. <laughs> although they... They yeah, they, although they differed, and I, I mean, I've read that she tried to convert him to to an objectivist ethics. He just he didn't buy it. That doesn't take no, away I from think, his contributions. I think, have, I think in some ways he may have been influenced by her, even, and he certain and she certainly was impacted by him. She sought out intellectual connections. She sought out her relationship with Isabel Patterson. She sought out her relationship with Henry Hazlitt. She, people she admired, writers, journalists in the 20th century, she admired as a young woman. She actually sought to make intellectual connections with, despite the differences. Isabel Patterson believed in God. I mean, she's kind of a deist or more than a deist, but, you know, sort of on the deist end, but she believed in God. And she'd argue with Ayn Rand about God. Henry Hazlitt, like you point out, was a classic. You read his, he wrote a whole book. The foundations of morality, yeah. a whole book on ethics, and he, again, like Mises, he's think, he mostly equates ethics with social ethics, and like Mises, he's a utilitarian. <laughs> Excuse me. Yes. So of course, as objectivists, but wait a minute, my objectivist friends, he when he was learning, he did not have, he did know Ayn Rand, but when he was getting his self-education, he didn't have the uh, the advantage of Ayn Rand's novels, okay? He, he was already already a very successful uh, man who'd published several books by the time <laughs> The Fountainhead came out, for example. And so uh, it, I think we don't appreciate the originality of Ayn Rand if we do that. We uh, Wait That's a minute. A good point. Mises and Hazlitt didn't have the advantage of having Leonard Peikoff explaining objectivism like the rest of us do, huh? They never had the advantage of having their lives changed by Atlas Shrugged as, say, younger people when it could have had a bigger impact on them. Um, I take those kind of things into account when I'm when I'm assessing a person. But the broader point you make is the correct one. To say, just because someone isn't an objectivist doesn't mean they don't have important values. Were both of these men intellectually honest? Absolutely. Do I do I detect any insincerity or pretense in them? No. Do I detect a lot of hard thinking and honesty in these men? Yes. These men are heroes, moral heroes. If if I can just quote John Galt, there is nothing more heroic than the human being who chooses to think and use his mind. And this, this, these guys are heroes of the mind who contributed massively uh, without Henry has, I mean, uh, my theme, if I'm going to have a theme for my discussion of Henry Hazlitt would be that few people, I mean, in apart from Ayn Rand, I would. This is literally what I'm. I'm going to say, and I mean this in all sincerity. Apart from Ayn Rand, Henry Hazlitt had the greatest impact on developing an intellectual defense of the free market in the 20th century. You see, I think that the works of Mises and Hayek were inaccessible to a lot of people. Yeah, they're too too and erudite. Hazlitt right? was able to translate the ideas of Austrian economics into such crystal clear, simple, easy to digest conversational prose. He was a master writer. He knew how to take very complex material and reduce it to simplicity. And in this respect, and Ayn Rand, I would just point out that in Ayn Rand's own magazine, the magazines that she edited, the Objectivist Newsletter and the Objectivist, she had nothing but she had repeated reviews of the works of Mises and Hazlitt, and they were all glowingly positive. Even if they had a little footnote, no, I don't agree with everything he said, Ayn Rand nonetheless would say things like, Mises is the greatest economist of our time. Henry Hazlitt is the clearest writer on economics that we have. We are blessed to have both men. That was Ayn Rand's attitude towards them. So my objectivist friends, I think you, mm, I, I, you might want to think about Ayn Rand's own opinion on, on these men. And it uh, by the way, this included Isabel Patterson. Um, uh, she uh, wrote a dazzling positive review of God of the Machine. Sure, she had her little footnote, I disagree with her here and there, but the review was a dazzlingly positive review. So even if she had differences with her friends on the free market side, she was still an advocate of their written works, and she praised them to the skies. 
Um, so, and they were positive contributors. She knew that their hard thinking and their brilliant writing was a positive contribution. So I would plead with my objectivist friends not to dismiss people just because they're not objectivists. No, we do have objectivism. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. Okay. And I love it. It's changed my life. That's the way I look at it. But that does not mean that there aren't very important writers from the 20th century who were extremely important in the cause of liberty. Mises, Isabel Patterson, and Henry Hazlitt did more to popularize it, to spread it, to make it known and comprehensible to the layman um, than just about anyone else other than Ayn Rand I can think of. And so if you're going to think who had the most power, who had the most penetration in creating a, a, an understanding in the American population of the virtues of the free market, Ayn Rand and Henry Hazlitt are at the very top of that list without much, <laughs> and the competition would have to be a distant third, fourth, and fifth, honestly, <laughs> in terms of their popular impact on getting the free market understood by the American people. You know, Not I'm exactly. all... I've often thought, Jim, that like if somebody wanted to make a quick conversion to the layman to bring them over to the to the free market side, to have them read, I would say, the law by Frederick Bastiat and economic in one lesson, economics in one lesson by Henry. Oh, it is no accident that you bring those two up in the same breath. Well, <laughs> this, this, well hold on one second. I want to tell okay. you something. So, <laughs> when I first got the book Economics in One Lesson, it came in a, in a, a box set, I believe, with. Uh, Atlas Shrugged and Human Action and a couple other books. And I couldn't read them all at once. So I lent them out. And uh, the guy that I lent the Economics in One Lesson to, I had lent other books to. He came back with Economics in One Lesson and said, this is the book. He said, if you want to bring anybody in, convince them to be a libertarian, this is the book that they should be reading. Because it was so clear and simple and yet so powerful a case for the free market. It, it, it's an absolutely astounding book. Now, I'm, you're going to get to the scene and the not scene, Jim, so go ahead. Yes, well, but no, we can leave that. So I would just <laughs> something about what you just said just t tickles me completely. There are certain books in my life that I never can help keep a hold of because I'm giving them out. And one of them is The Fountainhead by Ayn Rand. But you know something? One that I give out just as frequently, and I looked for <laughs> this morning because we were going to do the interview. I looked for it. I said, "Yeah, I always have a copy of Economics in One Lesson, uh, but I always have to buy new ones." I think that in the course of my life, I have bought at least two dozen copies. I'm not exaggerating. Two dozen copies of Henry of Henry Hazlitt's Economics in One Lesson. That is the book that I usually, if someone is seems a willing reader and and and, and an honest uh, uh, listener, that is the book I will give them. I will go right to my shelf, hand it to them, and say, "You keep this, you read this." And so, because of that, I think I've gone through at least two dozen copies of Economics in One Lesson because I hand it out so frequently. It is the go-to book if there is any person who's not familiar with economics that you know. And you want to give them the best, the simplest and most straightforward introduction to the entire subject. There is no better place, sim I, bar none, bar none, than economics in one lesson. The clarity of his writing is unbelievable. As I say, the ability to reduce to something that any reader just about can digest uh, easily is unmatched. And you bring up Bastia. My God, he was tremendously influenced by Frederick Bastia, and he very much wrote in that same style of Frederick Bastia. But my God, those two guys are like some of the most powerful and effective um, in terms of their clear uh, rhetoric on the issue of freedom. Uh, 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 I highly recommend both Bastia and Hazlitt very much in this sense for the same reason. And Bastia was a tremendous influence on Henry Hazlitt in this yeah. respect as well. Uh, but economics in one lesson. Okay, let's talk about it. In 1946, well, let me just tell you, from 1934 to 1946, Henry Hazlitt was basically the economics editor of the New York Times for almost 12 years. He wrote all of their unsigned editor. You know, go to the editorial page of a newspaper and you'll see the editorials that are signed, the op-eds like they call them, or the unsigned editorials, which are sort of these silent voice of the editors of the paper, right? He wrote the unsigned columns on economics for the New York Times. He also wrote a signed column, his signed opinion piece for the uh, just about every issue. So he's got uh, a tremendous body of work as an editorialist on economics and financial matter that deal with everything from the daily headlines to 
theoretical work uh, of, of other economists. So as the uh, ed economics editor, in effect, for the New York Times for almost 12 years, he was probably, you know, think of Paul Krugman today, the Nobel Prize winning economist who basically has the same job for the New York Times today. He was that for 12 years at the end how, of the depression. How far they've fallen, huh? How far the mighty have fallen. <laughs> well, and he had a falling out with Arthur Salzberger, you know, the Salzbergers own the New York Times. And he had a falling out with Papa Salzberger uh, over the Bretton Woods issue. He was absolutely convinced that this would lead to inflation. And uh, of course, Arthur Salzberger and the economic establishment were all in favor of Bretton Woods. And so he had a parting of the ways and he went to work for uh, Newsweek magazine, writing a signed column. Uh, again, for what was it, almost 18 years or something. And when he left there, guess what? They hired three people to take his place. Paul Samuelson, the guy who wrote the standard text, and Nobel Prize winner Milton Friedman were just two of the three people that they hired to replace Henry Hazlitt at Newsweek as their economics uh, journalist. So uh, he was a mighty force in the field of economics journalism in the middle of the 20th century. Uh, and the Perhaps the most accessible uh, aspect of his work is this book that he published in 1946, Economics in One Lesson. And there, as you say, he, dis he puts things in such a magnificent manner. People can usually, you know, perceptual level, Ayn Rand would call it, can see things and they take the reality of what they see uh, and they can't necessarily, because it takes a conceptual process to imagine and to play out the unseen, the invisible. So the seen and the unseen play a very important role here. And the long term versus the short term and the total effect as opposed to the narrow effect. And by introducing the reader to these concepts, he's introducing you to the conceptualization that is necessary. It's beautiful how he sort of brings a, even a lay reader step by step along in the conceptualization of the long term the invisible, the total sum effect of a policy as opposed to some narrow aspect, one one bit of the effect. No, you have to consider the whole effect of the policy, including the unseen, including the long term. And so let's say the government builds a bridge. Everyone can see that bridge and everyone goes, yay, what a beautiful bridge. What we don't see are the cost, what that happened. See, and if it was just each of us having to pay eh, just a penny, it was a million of us. It cost a million dollars, let's say, to build the bridge. I'm making up these numbers from nothing. Say it cost a million dollars to build the bridge, and a million people only had to pay a dollar apiece. That's just one dollar to them. They hardly noticed the one dollar that went down the larger tube of their taxes, but, but they can see that beautiful, shiny new bridge. It's isn't it wonderful that the government has built this bridge. But think about it. To build a million dollar bridge, you had to take a million dollars out of the economy that would have otherwise been spent by these people. I would have spent an extra dollar on, you would have spent an extra dollar on, she would have spent an extra dollar on. And so to you, me, and the, the, that one little dollar that we each have may have been totally under the radar screen. But the fact of the matter is to build a million dollar bridge, someone's got to spend a million dollars and that million dollars got to come from somewhere. We're going to pay for that million dollars, whether you, we, that's the thing. So much of welfare econ economics, Keynesian economics, or a socialist economics depends upon this little sleight of hand, this little sleight of hand. You don't see who's paying for it. You don't see the long-term effects of it. And uh, Henry Hazlitt was trying to get us to see uh, another brilliant analogy, the broken window analogy. And I'm afraid here he really shatters Lord Keynes. Lord, Lord, and we will talk about his, I hope we will have time to talk about his 1959 work, The Failure of the New Economics, which is that, an effect. That was my of, next transition. Yeah, sure. which is in effect a line by line critique of Keynes's general theory. Um, and it, it's true, he says, nothing uh, original, he says, is true. And, and, and uh, or, or how did he put it? I forget. Uh, it's something that he, he says, nothing uh, original that's true and nothing true that's original. Original, that's it. And he basically goes through line by line. And uh, Keynes says some silly things like destruction is good for the economy or savings is a drain on the economy, is leakage in the economy. And to re refute this <laughs> perversity that comes from Lord Keynes' economics, he, th he created a mind experiment, the broken window fallacy. Right. Well, isn't it true that when a kid, you know, the kids are playing baseball outside and they throw a baseball through your window, isn't that really good for the economy? 
because after all, that broken window is going to need to be fixed. And you're going to need to get a glass guy over there or a window repairer over there. And you'll employ more glass will be made. You'll employ this window installer. And isn't that good for the economy? Haven't we, in fact, juiced up the economy by breaking the window? No, 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 no. For you see, just like with the seen and the unseen with the bridge, so it is with the window. The homeowner would have spent, say, let's say he only has to spend $10 to fix the window, but that's $10 he would have spent on something else. It can't be a net plus to the economy because the $10 he spends on the window is gone and he wouldn't have spent the $10 elsewhere. It's not in the long run or in the total net effect going to be positive for the economy. Indeed, it's a negative. Because had the window not been broken, he would have had a window and that $10 thing he would have bought in addition. So breaking windows is not a good thing. You just get broken windows and less. Uh, if you look at the total effect and the long-term effect, which is what he's getting you trying to get the reader to see uh, again and again with these eloquent, beautiful metaphors like the broken window, the seen and the unseen, and trying to get you to conceptualize economics. And so he does, he takes you down the path of a few, to, and all it takes is a few examples in economics to apply these beautiful little metaphors to, right? <laughs> and so, for example, classic free trade tariffs is a gem of one, right? The, you, tariffs are, you know, you could, uh, Trump, Good God, if you could give Donald Trump a copy of economics in one lesson, just to give him a basic lesson on one of the most earliest things that economists should have and could have gotten through to us, is that tariffs are counterproductive. Now, this is something economists have been screaming for quite some time with all of their eloquent arguments, but Henry Hazlitt puts it in such a clear way that even someone uh, as dumb as, I, I don't know, maybe Donald Trump isn't dumb, he's not completely stupid, uh, but in any event, I'm sure even Donald Trump could grasp that uh, tariffs are counterproductive. It's like shooting yourself in the foot every time. So let's see, we're gonna protect US automakers by putting a tariff on Japanese cars. That was a big thing when I was a younger guy. And so what does that mean? Americans now have to pay more for Japanese cars, but they still prefer Japanese cars. <laughs> but now their choice is, do I take the crappier value <laughs> in effect at the same price but in effect, you can't totally help the economy. Again, this is a classic moment of the seen and the unseen. Mm -hmm. You're shooting yourself in the foot uh, every time with a tariff. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah, I would, oof. Donald Trump and all his tariff friends really ought to read uh, Economics in One Lesson and get uh, bitch slapped uh, uh, <laughs> as, they, as they properly deserve. Uh, because uh... <laughs> you, heard, you heard it here first, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> James Stephen Valiant saying that Trump and his tariff friends need a bitch slap. <laughs> you know, because the truth is that, look, even if there is, when you go to war, and even if you are having trade restrictions, you have to realize it's a cost to your economy. It's not a good right. thing. And, and, he, and he also he points that around. out too, Jim. He points well, out... Well, in economics in one lesson, he points out that wars are not, contrary to popular opinion, wars are not good for the economy. It's a giant broken yeah. window, isn't it? Minimum wage laws are not good for the economy. Unions are not good for the economy. How can they be? How can they be? And if you think about it in his terms for just five minutes, once you get his metaphors and then you start thinking long term, it's like, yeah, of course, that's got to come from somewhere. That's going to come at the expense of that. Or in the long run, it's going to mean this. And that's what the, the absolute value of Henry Hazlitt's book is. It gets you to start conceptualizing like an economist. Think of the unseen. Think of the long term. Think of the, you know, unintended consequences. And if Austrian economics is teaches us that, and it teaches us that, in a, like we were saying about Mises and the Austrians, in a uh, methodologically individualist way, Henry Hazlitt is the clearest. I mean, just the crystal clear exposition of that kind of method will be is unmatched, is unmatched in economics in one lesson. And if you know anyone, anyone within the sound of our voice, if you know anyone who is even slightly interested in economics, by far the best introduction is economics in one lesson. Uh, I think it will be hard to supersede it even it really will be oh, it, it's great yeah yeah i i could show it but i don't have it here because i'm in the well i've moved but some of my books are still at my old place as you can see i look like a homeless guy i don't even know where my razors are <laughs> anything <laughs> you know uh, henry hazlitt 
might be the only person in the history of the planet to be praised by H.L. Mencken, Ayn Rand, Ludwig von Mises, and Murray Rothbard. <laughs> right. Right. That well, is a hell of an accomplishment. It is. It is. Well, he was a hell of a man. He was a hell of a man. Uh, he really was. He was the surviving fragment of a classical liberal past. As I say, um, he came to know economics uh, pretty much, uh, like I say, working at the Wall Street Journal. And he started to get to know Benjamin Anderson, who was a professor who had, had been a professor of economics at Harvard and who was working at the time for Chase Bank. Oh, and, oh, hold on, hold on, hold on. Ah, uh, where is it? Ah, I can't get it, Jim. Ah, <laughs> uh, 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 Benjamin, there he is. <laughs> well, he, as a young man, as a young man, he personally knew Benjamin Anderson. And uh, when he was working for Chase, ba uh, Ch Chase Bank in New York City, and he was a, a, a young journalist, and he learned a lot from Benjamin Anderson, including about this, Austrian School of Economics, <laughs> and it piqued his interest, and he began to become a very serious student. He'd read a book by Philip Wickstein on uh, practical econ economics earlier that had a big influence on him, but it was his conversations with Benjamin Anderson that really got him into theoretical economics. But the guy was an astonishing autodidact, and I mean astonishing. He Although he never really got a university degree and never really attended university, he got the equivalent of multiple PhDs in my mind. You can read that in his work. The, his erudition is astonishing. He was a literary critic. He was a historian. He was a novelist. He was uh, uh, he became an expert on a thorough expert on economics, and all on his own, all by doing his own reading. Uh, and like, you know, his first book published in 1916, uh, Thinking as a Science, uh, when he was only 21 years old. And it, it, an objectivist would, would find it interesting because he says, you know, everyone knows there's problems in the world. Uh, and uh, uh, it's true, there's a bunch of problems in the world, but everyone's got their own pet peeve. You know, the feminists uh, think it's been the suppression, the oppression of, you know, of women. Socialists think it's, you know, the working class. You know, my pet peeve? thinking straight. I think it is the fundamental. It is the cause of most of the rest of the other problems. And an objectivist, I think, would agree with the basic point. Now, it is not an introduction to objectivist epistemology. He's not making breakthroughs in epistemology, but he is giving a series of really good practical advice on how to think. And you could tell what an ambitious young man he is, what an autodidact he is by the age of 21, and how well read he is by the age of 21. Uh, and it's going only going to get more and more and more. The man is going to become this storehouse, this powerhouse of information, and one able to distill it and digest it so that it can be understood by his readers as a journalist. Um, in 19, he, as I say, in the 1920s, he worked both as an economics journalist, but also as a literary critic, a literary critic. And so in the, in the 20s, 30s and 40s are known as the era of the great American novel. Uh, so this is when Ernest Hemingway and John Dos Passos and William Faulkner and John Steinbeck and Tell Me to Stop and even Ayn Rand were writing their, their, their great novels. And so the, this period of time, this interwar period, is considered one of the great golden ages of American literature, the era of the great American novel. And he was there on scene at the time writing literary reviews. The upshot of it was, in fact, a book called The Anatomy of Criticism, which he published in 1933. Uh, as a result of his, and he, as I say, he was the literary critic for, yes, the left-wing magazine, The Nation. It, you know, with The New Republic, we think of The Nation as one of the two leading intellectual magazines on the left in America. Well, it, it transitioned from being classical liberal, believe it or not, to being socialist in the 1920s. At one time, The Nation magazine had a more classical liberal orientation, and it moved over into a totally socialist. And so while he was there, he not only was a literary critic, he wrote... Uh, something on uh, practical politics, which gave a free market solution to the Great Depression, as opposed to the New Deal that we were getting. Well, this brought him into trouble with the editors at the Nation magazine. And he had to, after debating the editor of the Nation, he parted company with uh, the Nation magazine. 
At well, this point, though, having published, uh, just finishing the thought on his literary criticism, uh, in 1933 with the anatomy of criticism coming out, Henry Louis Mencken, the world famous uh, journalist, critic, uh, literary critic, I mean, H.L. Uh, Mencken, the guy who uh, made the scope, he's the journalist, sort of parodied in Inherit the Wind uh, by uh, uh, Gene Kelly's performance. He was the guy that made the Scopes Monkey Trial a world famous thing. He got Clarence Darrow to go defend the, the teacher who's teaching evolution. Uh, and uh, that was just one of the famous moments of Henry Louis Mencken's l legendary literary career. Uh, he founded a magazine with George Jean Nathan, Nathan called The American Mercury. And it was a very famous uh, elite literary magazine, uh, even though Mencken's views would come to be very controversial and make him an iconoclast. He was highly regarded by intellectuals in his time, even those who were critical of him. Uh, so uh, Henry Hazlitt uh, uh, got the most amazing compliment from H.L. Mencken. He said, he is the one economist who can truly write he is an economist of both practical and theoretical education, and he's also a great literary critic. And so, but the one economist who could truly write, and it's true that most economists are very dense and sometimes hard to read. And uh, Henry Hazlitt is just the opposite. Mencken understood this, praised him, and he was his hand chosen successor to be editor of Mencken's own magazine, uh, The American Mercury. Um, and uh, but it didn't last very long because, of course, Henry Hazlitt, being the, true to his ideas and a man of principle, had another argument with his editor, Alfred Knopf. The legend yes, Alfred Knopf was the publisher of the American Mercury. He would later be the father of the great Knopf publishing empire. Well, Henry Hazlitt had a dispute with Al Alfred Knopf and left. It was only the American Mercury for a short time, but shortly thereafter, he was hired as the uh, finance and economics editor for the New York Times. Amazing guy. You actually said the word, Jim, that I was going to ask you about. Was he, in addition to being brilliant, he was a man of principle. He lost more than one job because he wouldn't compromise his beliefs. The New York Times, he left because of a disagreement over Bretton Woods. Uh, uh, the Nation magazine, he left because of a disagreement. They were going left and defending the a New Deal and FDR. He disagreed and left. He had disagreements with Alfred Knopf. He left the American Mercury. He was a man of principle, and he would draw lines. Uh, and he would—he was not uh, a man to bandy words. And so he could tell he liked he, both Mises and Rand. You, know, you don't become personal friends with both Mises and Rand, and you and, and you're squeamish about strong opinions, or you're you don't admire people of principle. He admired people of principle. He was really instrumental. He. You know, when uh, Mises' books in the 1930s were being translated into English, he promoted them big time. In 1938, he wrote a review of socialism, for example. He called it a classic. He called it the greatest refutation of socialism ever penned. He compared him to Adam Smith. He said it's as if we're living in the age of Adam Smith. So he's a great admirer of Ludwig von Mises, and he did powerful work uh, promoting the work of Ludwig von Mises in the 1930s in his reviews. And when Ludwig von Mises fled Europe uh, shortly before the outbreak of World War II, uh, Henry, Has uh, Henry Hazlitt was the one who really got him the job teaching at New York University. He met him at the dock in, in, in the harbor of New York when uh, uh, Ludwig and Mar Margit von Mises arrived in New York City and th th thereafter became close friends with the Miseses. Uh, uh, and Guess what? He was already a friend of Ayn Rand's. Even before Ayn Rand's fame with the Fountainhead, he and his wife were both friends of Ayn Rand. Francis Hazlitt, his, Henry Hazlitt's second wife, was uh, 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 Henry Hazlitt's interesting guy uh, in all kinds of ways. But uh, he and his second wife um, uh, were real intellectuals. His wife was working at Paramount Studios, uh, uh, l literally in Hollywood at the time, and Ayn Rand was a, uh, doing reviewing screenplays from other writers. That part of what she would do before she became famous and could support herself with writing is uh, review scripts and books, uh, especially foreign language stuff, because she knew French, she could read German, she knew Russian, and so she would review foreign language material for Hollywood producers like Paramount. And she met Henry Hazlitt's second wife, Frances, doing that. 
Um, but she was a great admirer of Francis Hazlitt's husband as a journalist. And she, I, I got to meet your husband. Yeah, we got to become friends. And so he was friends with both, mind you, Ludwig von Mises and Ayn Rand, and he knew he had to get them together. He was the one who introduced the most consistent advocates of laissez-faire capitalism in the 20th century to each other. And he knew he had to. Uh, because he, you could tell he personally had warm feelings for both of them. Um, and uh, indeed, the three of them would do nothing but praise one another for the rest of their lives. Yeah, that's, that's three of a kind. kind that beats a full house any, any day of the week. That's uh -huh. three of a kind. And whatever differences any of them had with any of them, they were largely full of praise for one another thereafter. And if there were three people who really created an intellectual defense of the free market in the 20th century. It surely was Rand, Mises, and Hazlitt. And Hazlitt was the glue between the two biggies there. And he was the clear articulator for Americans in plain language of what the Austrians were up to. Now, you mentioned his book, The, the Failure of the New Economics. His, yes. I mean, he really meticulously, point by point, just a point, eviscerates. literally a point. Uh, uh, yeah, he, yeah. I mean, he, he says this is what Keynes says. This is why it's wrong. This is what <laughs> why says, wrong. wrong. All the way through the, the general theory, uh, a of thorough the refutation of the general yeah. theory by Lord Keynes. Yeah. Before I bought the book, I actually read it. I think it was in Mark Skousen's Making of Modern Economics, and he talked about it. And he said it it, it it largely just ended up sitting on the bookshelves, collecting dust uh, on the bookshelves of libertarians because. People just aren't reading it. Right. And so when I got it sent to me, I was prepared for it to be a difficult book. But I made sure I went through it. But he really does just destroy Keynes. Destroy it. And yet the book doesn't you have much influence. what Von Baverk does to Marx as an economist? <laughs> if you really want to just go one place and get it thoroughly, because, you know, when I was I, not all my I did go to NYU and have some wonderful Austrian economics professors, but not all my professors were Austrians. I would have to say that those who were not were generally sucked in by Keynesian fallacies of one sort or another. The others were all basically Keynesian. And so it was very helpful to have Hazlitt under my belt. And so I could ridicule the broken window or that savings is leakage or that, you know, <laughs> and get them refocused on, you know, uh, correct things like productivity, which, of course, Keynesians are very, very bad at understanding. Uh, but it's uh, thanks to Henry Hazlitt that I was able to do that, uh, that if you're looking for a one stop shopping place to refute the general theory. Now, the general theory doesn't have all of the Keynesian because lesser Keynesians after Lord Keynes developed his fallacies into even bigger fallacies. And so, you, <laughs> but it's true, right? But in any case, uh, it's not the complete, but it's Lord, but it's a complete refutation of Lord Keynes, his own uh, uh, view of it. Yeah. Yeah, it's true. If I said it was a complete refutation of Keynesianism, no, it's a complete refutation no, it's a of, school, of the, yeah. Yeah, the general theory, because with Keynes yeah. came the circus and the, everything that came out. <laughs> but, Oh no, you froze on me, Jim. Uh oh. Oh no. But Hazlitt is to did I freeze? Oh no. you, you did. You froze. Frozen? You're not frozen okay. anymore. Okay, good. <laughs> you can hear me? I can hear you. Okay. Yeah. What 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 Bombavark was to Marx as an economist, uh Hazlitt is to Keynes. Uh the thorough reputation, root and branch. And your one-stop shopping for refutation of the leading economists on the bad guy side. Uh, yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. He, like I say, he was, but that's just his economics. That's just his economics. You know, uh, he was a very important figure in the development of the intellectual, the American intellectual right. Before William Buckley's National Review, he, uh, well, back up even further, towards the end of World War II, the former head of the Los Angeles Chamber of Commerce, a guy named Leonard Reed, wanted to start an organization, the Foundation for Economic Education. Uh, it really was basically the first kind of, you know, think tank in the humanities and economics. And if you think about it, that's an extraordinary thing. Um, and they began to publish a journal. The founding president was Henry Hazlitt. So L Leonard Reed wanted to bring him on board as, as a leader of this group right away, and he did. And Ayn Rand was, of course, served sort of as a ghostwriter for him behind the scenes advising Leonard Reed uh, as well. 
Uh, and uh, he wanted to contact, once Mises got to America, Leonard Reed definitely wanted to in integrate Mises too into this group. So think about Leonard Reed, who's trying to bring together Hazlitt, Mises, and even use Rand in, in starting up the Foundation for Economic Education and the magazine they published called the Freeman Magazine. He revived a title for an app from an abolitionist uh, journal that it existed in the 19th century and then a journal after it had revived and then he's reviving the name again the freeman in the 20th century but it began as a the title of an abolitionist journal in the 19th century and he revived it and uh henry first john chamberlain a very another very important 20th century journalist by the way a guy named john chamberlain a business and economics historian a famous book reviewer for the new york times editorial uh, he was the editorial director for Henry Luce in the 1940s, the founder of Time Life magazines. And he was the editorial director for Henry Luce in the 1940s. Very important journalist. So the first editor of the Freeman magazine was this guy, John Chamberlain. After a couple of years, they brought on Henry Hazlitt to be the co-editor of the magazine and Susan LaFollette as the managing editor. And then after 1952 to 1954, I believe, Henry Hazlitt was the sole editor of the Freeman. The Freeman magazine published many of the same philosophers, economists, historians, and journalists that William Buckley would have as his founding contributing editors. Basically, William Buckley just took over the, the, the writing crew that Henry Hazlitt had gathered. Uh, uh, over there, I mean, leading ex-communists. And that's the other thing. Most of the advocates of the free market by the middle of the 20th century, and most is probably an understatement, were former socialists or communists. I am not exaggerating. You can go right down the list. Um, James Burnham, the guy who wrote Suicide of the West, he was a former Trotskyite. Uh, Max Eastman, who wrote fa The Failure of Socialism, uh, was, of course, the leading Marxist journalist in America at one time. <laughs> he went over to the Russian Revolution and befriended Lenin and Trotsky. He translated Trotsky's History of the Russian Revolution. So these guys like James Burnham or Max Eastman are former communists, even John Chamberlain was a former socialist, but people like Whitaker Chambers, he was a communist spy, uh, but he never worked for Henry Hazlitt. But those smarter guys worked for Henry Hazlitt. People like Max Eastman, John Dos Passos, even <laughs> Frank Meyer. Nice dig at Whitaker Chambers, by yeah, the way. I know, I but I never had much much admiration <laughs> for the brains. He never was big on the brain pans, uh, <laughs> in my view. Uh, Whitaker. We went from being a communist to a Christian. You know, um, he was a religious kook all his life. <laughs> in other words. <laughs> Now, he did finger Alger Hiss as a spy correctly. I'll give him that. Uh, Alger Hiss was a spy for the Soviet Union, and Whitaker Chambers was correct about that. But that's all the credit I will ever give Whitaker Chambers. In any event, even he was a former uh, commie. And if you look at the list of founding editors of William Buckley's National Review, you will find that Henry Hazlitt is the only guy on the list, apart from Buckley himself, who wasn't a former socialist or communist. Henry Hazlitt was always an advocate of the free market as long as he'd been a writer. Uh, it began, I say, with his admiration of Herbert Spencer, uh, his in, the influence of Benjamin Anderson, then the huge influence of Ludwig von Mises and the Austrians. When Henry Hazlitt was writing for the New York Times, F.A. Hayek's book, The Road to Serfdom, came out. Henry Hazlitt wrote a front page of the book, New York Times book review, Front page, his praise of the road to serfdom by Henry Hazlitt in the New York Times. That caused Max Eastman, who was then roving editor of Reader's Digest, to have Reader's Digest do one of their con famous condensations of the road to serfdom. That review in the New York Times book review and that new Reader's Digest condensation brought the Fayak's road to serfdom to millions worldwide and made F.A. Hayek a world famous economist. Um, and uh, so it was in large part due to these guys in the middle of the 20th century, Henry Hazlitt and his friends, that Hayek's work became so well known worldwide and became so well known to Americans. <laughs> but uh, Henry Hazlitt was an astonishing guy. Uh, he, you know, although he was always an advocate of the free market, as long as he'd been a writer, he was also never religious. Uh, self-described agnostic all his life. Uh, he was never tempted by religion. And uh, he was also very interesting. Although he was a Stoic, he and his wife did a collection of uh, uh, on the Stoics. 
selected works from Seneca, Epictetus, uh, and Marcus Aurelius. They, they uh, were themselves students of Stoicism. But he wasn't a Stoic. You said he, he was, was not a Stoic. I would not. not you cannot classify. Yes, yes, yes. Okay. But he and his wife found value in Stoicism, very interestingly enough. He was a man of philosophic bent. Um, as I say, he wrote a book on ethics, the foundations. <laughs> he wrote a book, uh, you know, a, 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 a condensed uh, treatment of the Stoics. He wrote a book on literary criticism, the anatomy of criticism. Some people, now it's true, deconstruction only comes into existence with Derrida and others starting in the 60s and 70s. Uh, maybe you can push back a little later, but Derrida and, and deconstruction really only begins in earnest in the 60s. But his book, The Anatomy of Criticism, seems to anticipate a lot of the very issues uh, that the deconstructionists would bring up. Many people have observed that uh, his book, The Anatomy of Criticism, appears to be a prophetic refutation of deconstruction before it ever happened in literature. Um, and uh, like I say, he wrote a, a dystopian novel, Time Will Run Back. He even consulted with Ayn Rand on his novel. It was one novel, but uh, uh, he, uh, it was published in England under... In 1966, it was published in England under one title and America on another. The title I know it under is Time Will Run Back. It's a dystopian novel. So he, the man, and completely an autodidact, no university degree at all. And he was just one of the most remarkably erudite American journalists, maybe the most erudite American journalist who ever lived. Um, truly, to, if, I, if, you would, if you would find today a journalist working in America with half his erudition and self-education for all of their university degrees. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'd, I'd bet you money you couldn't find one. Uh, the, the Henry Hazlitt was that amazing of a guy, uh, okay. an honest guy. And uh, even Ronald Reagan praised him as one of the great influences on uh, modern uh, uh, conservatism. And of course, all the great libertarians, like you say, uh, Rothbard and, and John Hospers, and they all praised Henry Hazlitt to the skies. So libertarians, conservatives, and Ayn Rand herself all had nothing but the highest praise for the amazing, uh, erudite, eloquent gentleman that he was. Uh, he, uh, you know, if you've ever been to New York City and gone to Washington Square Park and seen that lovely area, he had one of those lovely townhouses on Washington Square Park where he lived most of his life. And he was just at the center of intellectual, in a sense, the intellectual life of all free market advocates in America for most of his lifetime. Okay, so in Henry Hazlitt, you have the guy that introduced von Mises to Ayn Rand. Yeah. He's the guy who ends up getting Hayek's Road to Serfdom in the Reader's Digest. Yeah. He writes the best introduction to economics ever. He writes yeah. a point-by-point -point refutation of Lord Keynes. He helped start the first free market think tank in uh, right. the Foundation for Economic Education. He's beloved that's by all, everybody. Now, that's all. <laughs> yeah, now, it's not like he did much. No. <laughs> he was the editor of the Freeman. When he became editor of the Freeman, uh, John Chamberlain was a fierce uh, McCarthyist. When he became editor of the Freeman, no, we're not going to be McCarthyist. We're not going to be commie hunters. And we're going to have a broader view of foreign policy. We're not necessarily going to be, you know, uh, these... You know, there was no neocons back in those days, but the strident seeing to fight communism was seizing hold of the right. And he was going to calm down and keep a measured view of that. Uh, and he wasn't going to be uh, religious. The na big difference between the Freeman, although the, the National Review stole all of Henry Hazlitt's contributors, basically, one of the big differences was the secular nature of the Freeman. He was he was going to have economics, history, journalism, but he wasn't going to have it in a religious direction or a monarchist direction. And sometimes Buckley would even publish monarchists, not just, uh, 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 but, uh, and in fact, uh, Buckley's religious religiosity in the National Review would not only cause the problem with Ayn Rand, his vicious, dishonest review of Atlas Shrugged uh, from Whitaker Chambers in 1957, but even Max Eastman, uh, parted company from the National Review saying Buckley's grown, he's made, turned his journal into a Christian uh, rag in effect. <laughs> and so one of the guys that really had helped Buckley get started, Max Eastman, turned away from him because it was growing too religious. But when Hazlitt was the editor of the Freeman, it was secular. It was pro-peace. The editor of National Review, you mean? Uh, no, National, no, no, no. When the Hazlitt was the editor of the Freeman, his Freeman was superior to the, the National, National Review, Review. Okay. because it was secular, not religious. 
it, and it, it was pro-peace, uh, you know, although it was anti-communist, it was still pro-peace. And he had a broader range of views on foreign policy. So as a journal, it was infinitely superior in my view to National Review, but it was the predecessor. It made possible the most important conservative journal of the 20th century. And Buckley himself stole basically his uh, main writers from, from Hazlitt's Freeman magazine. I'm not exaggerating. If you want a demonstration of this, all you have to do is read a book um, up, uh, up From Communism by John Diggins, a former professor of mine, where he discusses these former socialists and communists and their turn to the right. Uh, and uh, the emergence of the uh, intellectual right uh, in America there, there had really been no intellectual right in America. After the collapse of classical liberalism by the 1920s, among the uh, literati and the intellectuals, they were losing all confidence in the free market by the 1920s. It wasn't the Great Depression, mind you. By the time of the Great Depression, most intellectuals in America, most literary figures, most philosophers were communists. The New York Times editor of the Book Review in the late 1930s, a guy named Granville Hicks, wrote in the late 1930s, one cannot be a proper writer without first being a proper communist. <laughs> Eugene Lyons declared the 30s to be the red decade. The red decade. Uh, people were saying FDR saved capitalism from a much worse socialist or communist revolution that would have surely happened if, if the FDR had come along. I don't think that's true, uh, but that's the kind of way, that's how far gone we were. In the 1930s, there were practically no voices against the New Deal and FDR. The most prominent being the literary guy we just mentioned, H.L. Mencken, who was really alone and isolated in this, and Mr. Henry Stuart Hazlitt, the financial editor of the New York Times, were probably the two most prominent critics of the New Deal when everybody else was getting sucked in to the new welfare state uh, idea. Does, of it. Doesn't Garrett Garrett get an honorable mention? He didn't have the impact. He didn't have anything like That's the impact. That's why honorable mention. Okay, an honorable mention. <laughs> but I would give Ayn Rand an honorable mention. Fair she enough. was already writing things like We the Living and Anthem in the 1930s. She was very active herself, uh, uh, even before World War II. Um, but uh, the, the ones that were famous, the names in America, people in the 1930s, people like my, you know, reasonably well-informed, but not terribly deeply educated relatives might in, say, oh yeah, H.L. Mencken and Henry Hazlitt were the weirdos who were opposing the New Deal. They were famous journalists and, and writers at the time, but they were pretty much alone. Albert J. Nock went into retirement. He became a superfluous man, as he said in his memoirs. <laughs> now, he greatly admired the work of Isabel Patterson and Rose Wilder Lane, but he was basically receding from the scene because of the New Deal. Um, and uh, the, the active critics of the New Deal were few and far between. And when FDR ran for an unprecedented third term for president in 1940 and won, Henry Hazlitt, okay, I I'm going to park company here. He advocated a parliamentary system like they have in Great Britain, where the, the head of the legislature would be the executive because he was so opposed to the idea of this new king FDR who was, who was being elected for a third and a fourth time president like no other president in our history. He violated Washington's uh, precedent of retiring after two terms. And it was he hadn't anticipated the constitutional amendment, which would come later that would limit the terms of president. But in his anger at FDR's election for, for a third term, Henry Hazlitt wrote a book called The New Con a, a New Constitution Now, in which he advocated we seriously consider uh, constitutional reforms in the wake of our new king, FDR's third, unprecedented third election as president. Uh, I, I disagree with his proposed constitutional changes, but I sympathize with his uh, fear. Hatred of FDR. Hatred of and fear of FDR. Yes. <laughs> All right. Before I, I let you go, there's one more aspect of his life I want to I want to talk about, and that's his involvement with the starting up and the, the running of the Mises Institute. What do you know about it? Uh, how much was he involved? What was his influence? Obviously, they're a, a largely, if not entirely, anarcho-capitalist group. I, I'm not going to say that they're entirely. There's some guys over there that aren't ANCAPs. But Henry Hazlitt certainly wasn't an anarchist. But nonetheless, no. he was involved. What was his involvement and in, in how did that go? It is, well, you understand that he died in 1994, I believe. Yeah. At, no, no, no. 1993 at the age of 98. 
And so he dies at the age, he dies at the age of 98, had a good long life too, yeah. a good rich full life, right? And, uh, but we're talking about the last 10 years of his life. The Mises Institute was founded in 1982. And when it was founded, it was the original idea. So like I, I told you, I think in an earlier interview, I went to the inaugural meeting of the Ludwig von Mises Institute when they met for the first time in Washington, D.C. So I, and of course I was there at the invitation of Murray Rothbard, uh, but there were a lot of people there who I don't think would be comfortable with what it became by the mid 1990s. And there were people who were backing away from it and were even a little suspicious then. But a lot of the people who showed up at that first meeting would not be still there and supporting them by the end of the 80s. So, but besides Hazlitt was getting so old at that point and had largely retired by that point, it's hard to really know what, I'm sure he would have denounced their rank conservatism uh, when they're conservative. I'm sure he would have denounced their anarchism. Uh, he was an intellectual, a gentleman and a classy individual who would have found the place as it is today, the obnoxious stink hole that you and I know it to be. Um, I'm confident of that. He was a gentleman and an intellectual and no anarchist and no crude conservative by any means, as I think people can see from my uh, uh, outline of, of his life. But understand, this was when the Mises Institute went straight into the sewer. It was the last few years of his life, and he basically retired by then. And there were a lot of us there at the original meeting of the Mises Institute who would very shortly, shortly not be happy with the direction that Rothbard and others were taking it in. Let, let me just say that I, Jim's uh, stinkhole analogy notwithstanding, I do know some people from the Mises Institute that I that I get along with and that I, I think are good people and good thinkers. Well, well, <laughs> there are some good people still associated with it, but uh, as you've de delineated in other contexts, they are a place which uh, harbors some ugly conservative sure. and some ugly sure. honor and Mises would be turning in his grave. And I think Hazlitt would be complaining about it sure. in those respects. The very same respects that you complain about it are the very things that I think Hazlitt would be upset about uh, because he was such a great friend and admirer. I mean, Mises called Hazlitt the economic conscience of this country. And I mean, think about it. Um, and Hazlitt, was the great promoter of the work of Ludwig von Mises. And uh, I think that folks at the Mises Institute are awful lucky that both Mises and Hazlitt are gone because they would be taking a ration, a ration of criticism, I think right now from those towering minds, those gentlemen. Uh, and uh, sometimes when I hear Lou Rockwell, the last thing that comes to mind is intellectual or gentleman. Mm -hmm. Okay. Well, on that note, Jim, where can people find you? Well, I am active, very active with the Ayn Rand Center UK, doing podcasts all the time, multiple podcasts every week for the Ayn Rand Center UK. So if you're interested in my work, check us out there. I'm the author of Creating Christ, and we got a website, www.creatingchrist.com. Uh, if you're interested in the origins and history of early Christianity, I'd urge you to check it out. Um, I am active on Facebook. I'm there almost every day answering questions. I administer different pages there, and I'm constantly answering questions about either history or Ayn Rand all the time there. So please come to Facebook. Get me. I'm now on X, the former Twitter, and I'm starting to actually pick up a little audience there myself. <laughs> so uh, uh, you can get me there as well. Thank you, Michael. I'm also proud to say that i've actually become kind of a regular for you not and, kind of uh, you're in you're a regular uh, well sir i'm, I'm yeah. very proud to say that and i want to thank you for these discussions i don't thank have, you um, sir i don't have an opportunity to talk about my heroes uh this way um i have long been an such an admirer of henry hazlitt i was if you go to the wikipedia you know how wikipedia lets readers do the editing of the I am, I have to boast, it's secret because everyone uses these false handles when they edit at Wikipedia, but 30 years ago, I was the principal, and then again, 20 years ago, because I can't let them get away with any crap. I'm the principal author of the article, <laughs> the Wikipedia article on Henry Hazlitt. That's awesome. how much I love the guy. 
And so if it sounds like, if you go to the Wikipedia article, and if it sounds like what I did is just give you a summary <laughs> of that article, it's because I did no preparation. I, I, you know, for the Mises and Rothbard, I did preparation. For this one, Michael, I did no preparation because I knew I could do. That's how much I love Henry Hazlitt. That's well, you, how much I admire Henry you, Hazlitt. You, you were great regardless. <laughs> well, thank you very much. It, it, I just urge people to, to, to check out Henry Hazlitt's work. Sure. Start with economics in one lesson. You will not regret it. And, and Jim, next time we got to come up with someone else. There's so many of these people so to many. talk about. Thank you so much. For now, this is the Rational Egoist signing out. I'm Michael Leibowitz. Till next time.